Praise the Lord. Folks, it is 3 o'clock Central Standard Time here in the United States of America. We greet you warmly in Jesus' name from Dallas, Texas. Amen. It is time for worship and the word. Our worship may be simple. The preacher, God knows, is not the best preacher in the world. But I promise you, you will be able to benefit today from worshiping God and hearing from the word of the Lord. So I hope that you will join us and you will uh, be with us for the next hour and a half or so. And uh, I believe with all my heart that God has something in store for you. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Um, our brothers up in northern Oklahoma are planning on joining us next Sunday here live in uh, our sanctuary at home. And we are so looking forward to them being with us. They play instruments and they are going to be able to contribute to our service musically. And I really look forward to that. I wish they lived a whole lot closer or we lived a whole lot closer to them so that we could do this uh, uh, it's a regular thing, but that's all right. We'll take what we can get at this point. Yes, sir. So next Sunday, be ready to join us. It should be a very, very special, special time. And we're looking forward to having uh, our brothers with us, uh, Steve and Freddie. Freddie. I'm terrible with names. Uh, they also informed me this week that their neighbors had a death in the family and they asked us to be in prayer for that family and I would ask us today as we pray to remember that family continue to remember Tammy's family today Tammy was one of our own and we had to bury her a few weeks ago and we want to continue to remember her family uh, we also would like to remember today uh, Adam uh, he's been going through some battles, and we want to hold him up in prayer today as well. Amen. If you have a prayer request at any time, you can always share it with us on Facebook. You can direct message us. You can send us an email at the one church. That's T H E, followed by the numeral one followed by the word church, C-H-U-R-C-H, all one word, no spaces, at yahoo.com. And you can send us your prayer request at that email address, and we will be certain to remember it here when we pray. I want to remind you, we have a prayer board here at the church. If you have any special needs, uh, requests that you would like us to remember on a regular basis, let me know and I will print it out from your email or whatever and we will post it on our prayer board. And I come into this uh, sanctuary space here at the house and I literally pray over the prayer board. So those prayer requests do get remembered, okay? So by all means, uh, feel free to share your prayer requests with us. We're happy to help you pray. Praise the Lord. We want to begin our service today with a word of prayer. Now, I just want to point out to you, you all may notice that when I pray at the beginning of the service, it would be different if we had some folks here that I could tap to open the service with prayer and they could pray in whatever manner they feel comfortable with. But when I pray, I do not believe in approaching things uh, with a, a time limit on them. I don't believe that's how we ought to approach the Lord. If there are things that need to be prayed about, we need to pray about them. And that means if the opening prayer goes two minutes or if it goes ten minutes, uh, it all depends on what needs to be prayed about and, you know, things the church needs to remember. So when I pray personally, I pray whatever God lays on my heart to pray about. And uh, so, it, you know, there's no 
none of this word of prayer, moment of prayer, you know, where it breaks down. You start out with let's open with prayer to let's open with a word of prayer to let's open with a moment of prayer. By the time you're done, it's hello, Lord, we're here. <laughs> Amen. All right, we want to open this afternoon service with prayer. Let's go to the Lord at this time. King Jesus, lover of men's souls, creator of the universe, master of our hearts, we come before you today, Lord, with humility, understanding you're a great God, and we are your creation. We also come before you today, Lord, with great thanksgiving, gratitude and appreciation for the word of God declares I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart I will enter his courts with praise we come into this place today Lord acknowledging all the many wonderful things you've done for us throughout the course of our lives throughout the course of our relationship with you we're grateful God for the times you've healed us we're grateful Lord for the times that you've delivered us from demonic attack and uh, from the oppression of the enemy. We thank you, God, when you provided for our needs in miraculous fashion. Lord, when there was no money to pay the bill and you provided the money, when there was no groceries and you provided food. Master, today, how many times has our God come through for us in response to the prayer of faith? I can't even begin to count them all. But we're grateful, Lord, today for our walk with God. We're grateful, Lord, for our fellowship and communion with you by reason of your great Holy Ghost. We loose today in the house of God the Spirit of the Almighty. We ask God that you would flow richly and mightily through this place. Let every person who participates in our service, be it online, uh, be it physically in this location, let every individual feel the anointing and the presence and the power of God as though they were sitting in church with us. Heal the sick today, O oh God. Deliver from oppression, we pray. Lord, most of all, save the lost. Restore those who are losing ground at this hour. And Master, reclaim the backslider. Those who have walked away from their relationship with you. Many who have not walked away, but who have been pushed away by those within the church who don't know how to act like a member of the body of Christ. Master, we lift up today this family next door to Brother uh, Freddie today and Brother Steve. We ask God that you would be a comfort and a help to them at this very difficult time. Give them wisdom. Give them understanding. Help them, Lord, to make wise choices and wise decisions. Uh, at this time, Lord, and so often uh, we make decisions that are unwise and cost us a great deal in the long run. But we ask God that you would give them comfort and in so doing, help them to make wise decisions at this difficult time. Master, today let the love of God surround them. Let them know at this hour that somebody somewhere is holding them up in prayer and that the Spirit of God is present to be a strength and a help to them in their hour of sorrow. Lord, we lift up our brother Adam today. We ask God right now in the name of Jesus that you would touch him in body, touch him in mind. You're able, God, to heal and deliver, but more than able, you are willing. Lord, every time someone came to you and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me whole, your response was always, I will. Hallelujah. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask God right now that he, the spirit of depression that would try to come against his mind would be bound in the name of Jesus. We bind it upon the authority of God's word in the name of Jesus Christ and we cast it forth as dumb. In Jesus' name we claim deliverance 
right now for our brother. Oh, Master, today for Tammy's family, we continue to lift them up. We ask God that you would continue to be a source of strength and comfort for them at this very difficult time. Let them know, Lord, by reason of your spirit, by reason of your grace and your love, that somebody is holding them up in prayer and believing God for them. Master, in the name of Jesus, every request on our prayer board, Lord, every need that is represented there, both local and those that come in by reason of the internet, we ask God right now in the name of Jesus that you would minister to each and every need on that board where salvation is requested save, where deliverance is needed, God set free, where healing is necessary. Let the balm of Gilead flow in their direction at this very moment that they might receive the healing in their body that they so desperately need. Master, you're able to give strength to the elderly, to those who struggle uh, in their day-to-day -day living, and we ask God that you would continue to be a source of strength and help for those on our prayer board who need such help. Oh God, we need you. We need you in our nation. We need you, Lord, to protect our democracy, to maintain tranquility and peace. We need you, Lord, to help us as your church be an agent of peace and uh, bringing together and not dividing. For Lord, you've given us the ministry of reconciliation. Help us to be a sober voice in the midst of a church world that is preaching innumerable messages that contradict the message of Christ and this glorious gospel. Touched by reason of your Holy Ghost today, let the freedom that is found in the Spirit of God be manifest in the house of God at this hour. Let people watching feel that liberty in the Holy Ghost. And if they feel a shout, then shout. If they feel the Spirit stirring within them, then let them pray in the Spirit. Let them sing in the Spirit. Let them jump to their feet and leap and dance. For God, that Spirit, the Word of the Lord, declares is the Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We ask all this and none other than Jesus' precious, sacred, saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We have come into this house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Oh, worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. So forget about yourselves and concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself and concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself and concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Oh, worship Him, Jesus Christ the Lord. So let's lift up holy hands and magnify His name and worship Him. 
Let's just lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship him. So let's lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Oh, worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. For we have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Oh, worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Oh, worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, he's done so much for me, I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. He's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. He has taken my sins away. Oh, yes, he's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. He's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. He has taken my sins away. Oh yes, he's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. He's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. He has taken my sins away. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Every time I try to think about everything God's done for me, I become overwhelmed. There are so many things that I need to remember. There are so many wonderful things God's done in my life, not the least of which being this. My God is turning my mistakes into miracles, turning my losses into gains. Yesterday's trials are today's triumphs. On my desert he is bringing down the rain. I am learning while he's turning my whole life around. There's purpose and there's power after pain. God is turning my mistakes into miracles. He's turning my losses into gains. My God is turning my mistakes into miracles. Turning my losses into gains. Yesterday's trials are today's triumphs. On my desert he is bringing down the rain. I am learning while he's turning my whole life around. There's purpose and there's power after pain. God is turning my mistakes into miracles. He's turning my losses into gains. Oh yes, 
sheets, turning my mistakes into miracles, turning my losses into gains. Oh, yesterday's trials are today's triumphs. All my desert he is bringing down the rain. I am learning while he's turning my whole life around. There's purpose and there's power after pain. God is turning my mistakes into miracles. He's turning my losses into gains. Oh, my God has turned my mistakes into miracles. Turned my losses into gains. Yesterday's trials are today's triumphs. On the desert he is bringing down the rain. Oh, I am learning while he's turning my whole life around. There's purpose and there's power after pain. God is turning my mistakes into miracles. He's turning my losses into gains. God is turning my mistakes into miracles. He's turning my losses into gains. I said he's turning my mistakes into miracles. He's turning my losses into gains. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, I was thinking before church today, I was sitting here praying and listening to some music. <clears throat> and this song came very much into my heart. I thought, Lord, when I think back to what you've done in the past, when I think of all the wonderful things you've done throughout the course of my life and my ministry, I can't help but think <clears throat> that you can do it again. Hallelujah! He can do it again. If he's done it before, he can do it once more. He can do it again. He's done it before, he can do it again. He's still the same today and tomorrow, he's always there. He holds the key to unlock the door and let you walk in. If he's done it before, he can do it once more. He can do it again. He's done it before, he can do it again. He's still the same today and tomorrow. He's always there. He holds the key to unlock the door and let you walk in. If he's done it before, he can do it once more. He can do it again. He's done it before. He can do it again. He's still the same today and tomorrow. He's always there. <coughs> he holds the key to unlock the door and let you walk in. If he's done it before, he can do it once more. He can do it again. He's done it before. He can do it again. He's still the same today and tomorrow. He's always there. He holds the key to unlock the door and let you walk in. If he's done it before, he can do it once more. He can do it again. If he's done it before, he can do it once more. He can do it again. If he's done it before, he can do it once 
more he can do it again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm so glad that the things God has done in my life and in my ministry over the years are not done and finished. Amen. If he's done it before, he can do it again. Hallelujah. Oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. It's Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his garment. And his blood has made me whole. Oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. It's Jesus in my soul for I have touched the hem of his garment and his blood has made me whole oh it is Jesus. It is Jesus. It's Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his God. And his blood has made me whole. Oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. It's Jesus in my soul for I have touched the hem of his garment and his blood has made me whole oh it is Jesus, oh, it is Jesus, it's Jesus in my soul, for I have touched the his garment and his blood has made me whole for I have touched the hem of his garment and his blood has made me whole. And his blood has made me whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, it is Jesus. 
Amen. Today we're reminded of the love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Could we within the ocean spin? 
Glory to God. I love that song today. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hand in hand to you with Jesus. Hallelujah. Once from my poor sin, saved soul, Christ did every bird done wrong. Now I 
and I don't know about y'all, I'm going to sing this again. This song reminds me of my old Riverside days. Hallelujah. Listen to the words. Once from my poor sin, sick soul, Christ did every burden roll. Now I walk, repeat, 
For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Woo! Glory! Fear not! I will help thee. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Woo! I want to tell you, I feel the Holy Ghost today in a powerful way. I was feeling the Spirit of the Lord before the service even began today. And interestingly enough, I, you know, I didn't think my message today was particularly powerful or anything. I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to preach it. But I didn't have any special or particular thoughts about it. Oh, but I want to tell you, Glory, Glory to God, thank you, Jesus. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Glory to God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God, hallelujah. The Apostle Paul said, I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with my understanding also. I will sing with my Spirit and I will sing with my understanding also. Hallelujah. Woo! My spirit's feeling something today, something powerful. I'm glad for that. I need that. Oh, I'm going to tell you, that's the thing I love about living for God, the Pentecostal way. He is so real to us, and when we need Him most to be real and to be powerful and, and to touch us and lift us up, He is always present to do so. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. So oh, I feel the Lord today. Amen. I feel the Lord today, and I'm so grateful. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you open your Bibles with me to 1 John, the epistle of John to the church. 1 John, this is just before the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 4. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. People don't realize how powerfully the enemy works against the preacher of the gospel. And I'm here to tell you, he sometimes comes against our minds in, in such a powerful onslaught that we just about feel like the only thing we could do that would be the right thing to do is just quit, just stop. We feel so inadequate. We feel so much like a failure. He reminds us of past things. He reminds us of our weaknesses, our faults, our failures. And it takes everything in us sometimes to remember, child of God, when the devil starts telling you all about past failures and faults and weaknesses and fallings, all you got to do is look him in the eye and say, I don't live there anymore. Hallelujah. That was yesterday and this is today. Glory to God. I don't care what I did, what I didn't do, what I said, what I didn't say. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, those things are not my present. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe with all my heart that people can feel when there has legitimately, truthfully, honestly, sincerely been a change in our life. Mm -hmm. People who have 
seen us falter and fail and slip and act the fool and do things what not to have done, say things what not to have said. Tommy, as the years go by and we find a place of humility and we find a place of repentance, we go to God and we sincerely say, Lord, forgive me. I, I'm so sorry for what I've done. I'm so sorry for the stupidity. I compromised my integrity. I compromised my testimony. I compromised my witness. And I am so sorry, God. Forgive me, Lord. Help me. Help me. Never again to go down that road. And then, you know, years later, people may see you and they remember you from a different time. They remember you when you were doing things you ought not have been doing. It. But you know what? God is faithful. And the Spirit of the Lord is present in our life. And I believe with all my heart the Holy Ghost goes and whispers in these people's ears. He's not the same person you remember. Things have changed. Amen. You can feel the change in somebody. Glory to God. Amen. That's not my sermon today. That's just a little extra nugget from the Holy Ghost that I felt inspired mm -hmm. to speak. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 4 verses 16 through 19 I have it on the screen overhead and the Word of God today. Let me get my glasses. From the King James text reads as follows. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world. There is no fear in love but perfect love Casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Hallelujah. How can you not love him? John chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. If you'll join me once again for a moment of prayer, Father, once again, God, we come before the sacred throne of grace where it is said we are able to find mercy, to find grace in time of need. We humble ourselves in your presence, Lord. There's a powerful anointing of the Holy Ghost in the house of God today. And Lord, I... I didn't even come into this service expecting such a wonderful anointing, but I'm so grateful. The enemy this week has fought me and fought me hard. And God, if ever I've needed your help, Lord, to deliver a message to the people of God, I most certainly need it today. Not that I ever am without need of the anointing. But I need it even more now, even more today. Help me, Lord, to deliver to the people of God the message that you have placed on my heart for this hour and this time. Touch every ear, anoint every person that would hear, be it live, be it by reason of recording. Let their heart, their mind, their spirit today be open to receive the engrafted Word of God. Not merely the Word of God in passing, but let it, Lord, be carved into the very table of their heart, even as you carved the Ten Commandments into the tablets of stone for Moses. 
We ask it all today in none other than Jesus' glorious, glorious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. How can you not love Him? You know, the saddest part of what's going on in the church today is the fact that so many so-called Christians are in the church and they're quote-unquote serving God, they're quote-unquote living for God, not out of love, not out of devotion, but rather in response to fear. The majority of the theology that we hear preached from pulpits today is fear theology. It's as if many, if not most, in the church have come to the conclusion that fear is the best, most efficient way to bring people to an altar of repentance, mm -hmm. to bring the people of God into submission to the will of God and the leading of the Holy Ghost so that they might walk in the Spirit in their lives. But I'm here to tell you today that fear theology contradicts the gospel and the message and the person of Jesus Christ at every turn. Mm -hmm. Fear theology is a demonic theology. It is a counterfeit theology. It is not a biblical Christian theology. God does not call His people to fear Him. He calls us to love Him. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. And He does not as an abusive husband or an abusive spouse or an abusive partner of some kind, boyfriend, girlfriend. He does not merely demand that we love Him. But the Word of God tells us in verse 19 of our primary text, we love Him because He first loved us. I'm going to tell you, if you don't preach this gospel right, <coughs> then people are in church and they're doing religious things, but they are not doing so because they love Him, mm -hmm. because impression of a God who loves them. That's right. Their first impression of God is a God who sits in judgment of them, a God who condemns them, uh -huh. a God who is uh, angry with them, a God who is unpleased with them. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a little secret, my friend. For those of you moronic so-called Christians who sit in judgment of the unbelieving world and you yell, you know, God hates fags and God hates queers. That's garbage. Mm -hmm. That's garbage. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but come into everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I'm going to tell you a little secret. When the sons of thunder came to Jesus, wanting to call fire down upon a city because it was inhospitable to the Lord, and by the way, for those of you who don't have any biblical knowledge or any biblical sense, the sin they committed of in Hospitality is the identical sin that Sodom committed to the guests of Lot. And for that reason, that is the very reason the sons of thunder wanted to call down fire from heaven. They literally wanted God to do the same identical thing to this city. Listen to me, for the same identical reason he had done it to Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that interesting? We don't think about that, do we? Mm -hmm. 
Amen. I love to give y'all a little nugget here and there. Open your eyes. Make you see things a little more clearly. I want you to ain't a word in the Bible that isn't their own purpose. There isn't a single thing. If, if you really understand the word of God, I'm going to tell you, it is like one huge circle. It starts here and it goes around like this and it comes right back to where it started. It makes a perfect circle. You will never see it jiggering around like this and this and that and that. No, it's a perfect circle. Sometimes a friend or a family member will observe someone in the family as another is trying to woo them or win their heart, win their affections. You ever seen a family member, you know, a cousin or brother or sister, and somebody's just crazy about them and they're doing everything in their power to win your family member's affection and yet your family member just kind of ignores them and moves on and doesn't really pay them much attention. And you're asking yourself, how in the world can you not love that person? How in the world can you not love him? Or how in the world can you not love her? As an observer, they see the effort being made by the suitor. They see the flowers, the cards, the candy, the gifts, the thoughtfulness, the romance, the affection, the gentleness, the adoration. And they cannot help but wonder why it is that you are not responding to their efforts by falling in love. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. That's how it's supposed to be with believers today. The unbelieving world, those who don't know God are supposed to be able to see our relationship with the Lord. Forget about it. Don't worry about it. We got enough light. We're okay. Sorry, excuse me. They're supposed to be able to see our walk with God and our relationship with the Lord. And they're supposed to be able to recognize that God loves us. Look at how the Lord cares for His people. Look at how the Lord takes care of His people. And that in turn is supposed to help them to come into fellowship and come into relationship with God for themselves. They see how He treats us. They see how we walk with Him. The problem is too many Christians in the world today are living a religion of fear. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're living a religion of fear, I got news for you, honey. Your neighbor, your friend, your unsafe family member is not interested in your God. There is right. nothing, there is nothing demonstrated in your relationship with God that would make another person want to then enter into relationship with Him. And why should it not be that way? Mm -hmm. If I see a man who's abusive to his girlfriend and mistreats her and acts the fool and, uh, you know, abuses her in all kinds of ways, why would another woman look at that man and say, boy, I'd sure like to have him as my boyfriend. Hello now. Mm -hmm. No, most other women would look and say, boy, what a jerk. Look at what a jerk that man is. Look at what a fool that man is treating his girlfriend. Honey, seeing you abuse your present girlfriend is by no means setting this gal up to be your next girlfriend. Am I telling the truth? Yep. Amen. Or a woman, uh, you know, who's having an affair with a man and watches that man abuse and mistreat his wife and abuse her physically and emotionally and psychologically. She'd be pretty screwed up in the head if she then wanted that man to leave his wife and be with her. Hello now. But that's the representation that so many of us in the church today, that's what we're representing to the world. 
that we serve a God who's ready to pounce on us, a God who is just frothing at the mouth and wringing his hands, waiting for an opportunity to sit in judgment of us because he wants nothing more in this world than to pronounce judgment and condemn us to an eternity in hell. Honey, I'm going to tell you something. You don't even know God. You don't even have a clue who God is. The apostle John wrote and said, we have known and believed the love that God had to us. How many believers in the church today don't even know the love of God? How many believers in the church today don't really believe the love that God has to us? No. Their whole concept of God is based in fear. Their whole concept of God is based in judgment. Their whole concept of God is based in condemnation. But John then says, God is love. God is love. I'm not going to go into all the detail I could, but it would take forever, and I'm not going to do it. One of these days I'll teach on it. The Bible talks about seven spirits that proceed from God out of the throne of God. And yet we know that the Word of God teaches that God is a spirit. Mm -hmm. So when we read in the book of Revelation, these are the seven spirits of God, it almost looks a little confusing. It's like, well, how are there seven spirits and yet God is a spirit? If you were able to take seven different substances and you set them all in a pile and you set them on fire, the smoke that would rise up from those seven substances would be a combination of those seven things, would it not? Uh -huh. All right, but would you have seven smoking Pillars rising to the sky, would you have one pillar? You'd have one pillar because they all come together and they all mingle and they mix. But the seven spirits of God, I did a study on this years and years and years ago. I researched this and it was super interesting. Are seven aspects of God's person and God's personality that are so perfect and complete in and of themselves that you literally can say, God is this. But does that mean that if God is this, that he is not anything else, that there are no other attributes, that there are no, there are no other uh, parts to him or you know aspects to his personality or person? Not at all. But when the word of God said, God is love, that is one of the seven spirits that proceed. The spirit of love. Because God is love. He is so perfect and so complete in terms of the nature and the dynamics of love that when you say God, you're saying love. When you say love, you're saying God. The same thing can be true. God is holy. You see what I'm saying? That's one of the spirits that emanates from the throne of God. The spirit of holiness. God is righteous. The spirit of righteousness. What is righteousness? That means God always does the right thing. He never, ever, 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 ever is even tempted to do the wrong thing. That's why the Bible tells us that God is not tempted. You cannot tempt God. Because God, His nature is such that immediately He defers to the right. Do you follow? To doing the just thing, the right thing. So John said, God is love. God is so complete and so perfect. His nature, as far as love is concerned, is so perfect that it can stand alone. And I'm going to tell you, if you've ever been, I've been in meetings over the years where the Holy Ghost came down in that meeting. I've been at camp meetings and uh, conferences and what have you where the Spirit of the Lord came down, and I kid you not, He came down in the form and in the manifestation of just one Spirit. Meaning, He manifested Himself 
as the spirit of love. I was in a camp meeting, Church of God camp meeting years ago, and the Holy Ghost come down, and I've never in my life felt the love of God ever in my life like I did in that service. I will never forget it as long as I live. It was the most powerful, wonderful thing that I've ever experienced. Tommy, flip the switch on the light on top of the camera, please. That will help compensate the, the lighting keeps dimming and the it's on the bottom uh, left-hand corner there, closer to you, on the oh, bottom. Okay. Just flip that. So there you go. That should help to compensate a little bit because <coughs> this this lighting now keeps popping in and out on account of uh, somehow me turning these lights on. <coughs> But in that meeting, the Spirit of God manifested. And I will tell you, you couldn't feel nothing but love. There was literally no other... There was no other trait or aspect of God that you could even feel. The lighting was getting goofy, and I, I don't want people getting, you know. I apologize, folks. We're going to try to get back on track here now. When I was younger, and I was trying so hard, I was trying so hard to find me a wife, because I believed that if I found a wife, that I was going to be fixed. That the issues I had wrestled with since I was a child, since I was young, would suddenly be fixed uh, if I could just find me a good woman. Well, luckily enough, um, I, I am not entirely unattracted to women, so that's not a problem. Uh, and, you know, I found certain girls uh, attractive, and then I found certain girls... Um, I love their personality because I've always been attracted, even to this day. I'm very much attracted to a person based on a whole lot more criteria than merely their appearance. So I would look at their personality, I would look at their walk with God, I would look at, uh, you know, their Christian experience, and these things would very much appeal to me. So I would be attracted to various girls. Uh, throughout the course of my youth, you know, and I was trying so hard to fight off this issue that I was wrestling with and to fight off this issue that I was dealing with. And uh, I would try to win their affections. And honestly, because of the issue I was wrestling with, I always felt inadequate or, or not quite up to snuff and to be honest with you a lot of girls did a very good job of helping me to feel that way because it seemed like no matter who I was attracted to uh, I never could hardly seem to get any female to return her affections I mean I'd be interested in somebody and bless God uh, they were not even the least bit interested in me. And there were different gals over the years. My mother could tell you she saw me go through this and bless her heart. She felt so bad for me at times because I uh, really had a difficult time. You know, I was trying so hard to appeal to these young ladies. I did a lot of old-fashioned things. I sent them, boy that light is still just on, on the phone anyway, on the Facebook anyway. Um, I would send them flowers, I would send them cards, you know. I tried to do things the real old fashioned way, you know. Most guys today aren't quite as uh, into the old fashioned way of courting and you know, trying to win the gal's affections. But I did all these things, you know, and, uh, and the affections never seemed to be returned. As a matter of fact, the thing that was kind of funny, but at the same time it wasn't funny back then, 
is that while I couldn't get the girl to pay me half of mine, I always wound up with the mothers just loving me to death. The mothers, the grandmothers, the aunts, you know, all the women in these girls' lives just seemed to be crazy about me. I remember one gal, a holiness gal, that I was very much interested in. I thought she was very attractive. I, uh, I loved her walk with God and her relationship with the Lord. And I, there were a lot of things about her that I found very attractive. And... I tried to woo her, you know, with candy and cards and you name it, I did it. If I felt a little more comfortable about myself and felt like I had more to offer as an individual, I probably wouldn't have worked so hard and spent so much money. And I did spend a lot of money back then doing all this. And this particular girl just wasn't the least bit interested in me like so many of them. And finally, one day, her mother said to me, Sister Patsy was her name. And her mother, Patsy, said, Chuck, I'll tell you what, son. She said, if I had a young man as handsome as you trying to court me and trying to get my attention the way that you're trying to get Audrey's attention, she said, my Lord, have mercy, I'd be falling at your feet. I'd be so crazy about you, I wouldn't know how to control myself. And this was a whole of this lady. She said, honestly, you know, the things you do and, and the way you live for the Lord and the way you conduct yourself, she said, I'm telling you, I would be nuts about you if I were a young woman. She said, I don't know what it is about my daughter. And I remember I could go down a list of names different gals that I tried to woo, that I tried to, uh, you know, to get interested in me, and they never seemed to respond to my efforts. You know, it ought to be with believers that we so represent and emanate the love of God that one's rejection of Christ should be shocking. It should be unbelievable to us. But when we represent the Lord in such a way as to merit rejection, we have failed in our mission. And friend, I'm here to tell you today, one day we will answer in the judgment for that failure. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 6 through 12, the Word of God tells us we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know, know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, listen, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Mm -hmm. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. What I'm about to say is going to seem awful hard, and a lot of people are going to reject it wholesale, but you better hear what I'm about to tell you, my friend. If you cannot love the sinner as you love the saint, if you cannot love the neighbor as you love your fellow believer, then I'm here to tell you today, you don't know God. 
you may have yourself diluted, you may have yourself fooled, you may be believing a lie, and you may have yourself convinced that you know God, and you're walking in relationship with God. But in 1 John chapter 4, John makes it abundantly clear that love is the manifestation of our walk with God. If we genuinely know God, then love is there. That's right. I'm going to tell you, some of the most godly, the most wonderful, holiness people I've ever known in my life, the, the sweetest, most precious Pentecostal people I've ever known, they believed in very strict living. I mean, they live by all kinds of rules and regulations because they believe uh, sincerely that those things please the Lord and they were willing to do anything if it pleased God. And they lived their lives out of love and out of devotion for the Lord. But I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. They also were the most loving people you could ever know. When I first moved to Fort Worth, I've talked about this in the past. I didn't know Pastor Gillum, Brother Gillum for, at all. I didn't know his wife at all. But I began to go around town and I told you, I used to do a lot of business with a florist in Fort Worth. At the time there was a florist called John Winters Florist. And I used to go into his flower shop and do business there, you know. And uh, Mr. Winters and his wife and some of the employees, we were talking and I said something about being a member of Riverside Church of God. And he busted out and said, oh, I've got to tell you, that's Brother Gillum's church. He said, my goodness. That is the most loving, the most caring, the most compassionate man that I have ever met. He said, oh, I love Pastor Gillum. He is a marvelous, marvelous man. Personally, I'm a Baptist. But I'll tell you that Brother Gillum has to be, he and his wife have to be two of the most precious, loving, generous, spirited people I've ever met in my life. And as I began to do business around Fort Worth, Tommy, I began to literally hear that from person after person after person after person after. I could not believe the reputation that Brother Gillum had and Sister Gillum. But I'm going to tell you, everybody I met always said the same thing. Do you know how they started out their description of Brother and Sister Gillum? Those people are the most loving people. That's how they always started out their description of uh, brother and sister going. Yes. I attended a wonderful oneness apostolic church in East Texas. It is the church I was attending years ago when I finally decided to surrender and, and make the move into the apostolic movement. And the pastor of that church, uh, his wife was just one of the most precious. The Oh my goodness, this lady was one of the most precious saints of God I have ever in my life had the opportunity to know. And Sister Davis was her name. And I'm going to tell you, that lady... She oozed the love of God out of her pores. The love of God was so powerful in that lady's life. It was so wonderful. She was the most loving person I've ever met. I'll tell you. I, and you know, you can always tell when somebody, when their affection is fake, you know. And when somebody just really just has it in their heart, you know. And Sister Davis, I'm going to that lady, to this day I am in awe of her. Because the love that was demonstrated in her, the love that emanated from her. And guess what? For a oneness Pentecostal lady in a denomination that's famous for being judgmental and critical of everybody, I hate to say, because I love the United Pentecostal Church, but let's face facts, folks. There's a tongue twister for you. But I'm going to tell you something. I, I know a young lady who married a fella from that church. 
and she's born and raised Baptist. Well, they don't go to that church now. And uh, they, I guess they go to a Baptist church from what I gather. And uh, this young lady, I met her some years back, you know, and we were talking. And I asked her about Brother and Sister Davis and how they were doing and all. And she told me, and she said, you know, she said, that Sister Davis is the most loving person I have ever met in my life. She said, you know, I go to the grocery store or I go to Walmart or I go somewhere. And uh, Sister Davis, without fail, if she sees me, she said, that lady comes and wraps her arms around me, gives me the biggest hug and kisses me on my forehead and tells me she loves me. She said, my God, that is the most loving woman I've ever met in my life. She said, she is the sweetest, most precious, most loving person. And I told her, you're preaching to the choir, honey. I've been knowing Sister Davis an awful long time, many, many, many years, decades in fact. I said, I'm going to tell you something, you're preaching to the choir. That lady has got the love of God. I'm going to tell you a little secret. It's people like Sister Davis, it's people like Brother Gill and Sister Gill that we all ought to be hungering and desiring to emanate, mm -hmm. to uh, emulate and to behave like. We all, if all of God's people across this world were to live the Christian life the way these people do, with such devotion and such dedication, but completely devoid. You know, this girl told me, she said, I wear skin-tight jeans. You know, I wear t-shirts and I wear this and I wear that. She said, and of course, Sister Davis, you know, believes in the long dresses and the long hair and the long sleeve. She said, but you know what? She said, every time Sister Davis sees me, she just hugs on me and loves on me and just gives me. Now, you would think that this woman's husband, having left the apostolic church that Sister Davis and her husband pastor and attending a Baptist church and not living according to the rules and the way they believe to live in their church, you would think she'd be like so many and she'd be shunning these people. Come on now, you know I'm telling the truth. A lot of people be shunning these folks. They be, oh, I see, I'm not even going to talk to them because they're not going to the right church. They're not acting the right way. They're not living the way they ought to be living. But Sister Davis didn't do that. She emulated the love of God. Folks, God's plan of salvation was simple. He said, I will go to earth and be the kind of man that everyone can love and that everyone should love. Am I telling the truth? In the end, it was the hope of the Lord that by manifesting himself in a visible, tangible fashion, he would be able to demonstrate to the human race just who and what God really is like. Mm -hmm. Seeing this with their own eyes, they would love him as he desired to be loved by his creation. After all, what can make you fall in love with someone more quickly than their first demonstrating the height and depth, width and breadth of their love for us? If there's anything in the world makes you fall for somebody, it's when somebody shows you how crazy they are about you. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. You fall for somebody who doesn't even make an effort to act like they are interested in you. They don't even make an effort to act like they care about you. They don't even make an effort to indicate that they find you attractive or appealing. Of course not. Rejection of Jesus Christ today is nothing short of unrequited love. In Matthew 25, verses 35 through 40, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. 
this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Got something else to tell you, Lord, in the 21st century. Uh, the majority of those who claim to be part of your church don't even make an effort in these two areas. They don't even try to love God with all their heart. It's not about loving you. They're afraid of you. They're trying to do everything they can to avoid hell. They're not trying to do everything they can to see Jesus because Jesus terrifies them. Why do you think we live in a church world today where every sign that the Lord said would come which would precede His returning, the church tries to work against. we got to stop this from happening. we got to stop this from happening. we got to stop. What are you talking about stopping from happening? The Bible tells us these things must first come to pass before the Lord can come. So why in the world would you be trying to stop things that the Bible said must, must, must come to pass? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you're terrified. While you run around preaching fear and terror <coughs> to the unbeliever trying to make them afraid of the rapture make them afraid of a vengeful judgmental God honey you don't preach a message that you don't first believe that's right my own grandmother I, I hate to utter these words it, honestly it disturbs me to even say it my own grandmother was in the Pentecostal movement nearly 60 years or better by the time she passed and my old grandmother went to her death terrified terrified Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled woman she was terrified to die scared out of her mind why well I'll tell you why because she was one of the most judgmental critical negative nasty people you never want to meet she sat in judgment of everybody that ever stood in front of her well I got news for you honey you don't preach a message that you do not first believe mm -hmm. everybody who runs around preaching fear and condemnation and terror are people who believe in fact that that is the nature of God. Well, I've got news for you. If you're a, not a Christian today, if you're not a believer today, and you're under the sound of my voice, then you need to hear this and you need to understand this. Those people are not born-again Christians. They may call themselves born-again Christians. They may identify as born-again Christians. They may profess that they're born-again Christians, but they are not because love is not compatible with fear. You cannot have love and fear reigning in the same heart. Nope. Our primary text today said in verse 18, chapter 4, 1 John, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, mature love, complete love, casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. When you have fear in your heart and fear in your life, then you are tormented by that fear. He goes on to say, He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Oh, I want to tell you today. I told you how that in 2000 I lay in a hospital bed dying and a young doctor could not understand for the life of him how I had such peace and I was so tranquil and I was uh, completely ready to go and I was perfectly fine uh, with the notion that I'd soon be seeing Jesus and every time they came in and said, are you aware that you may die? I said, yep. So, well, how do you feel about that? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I keep living, I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep living for God. I'm going to keep trying to bring people into the kingdom of God. But if I die, all the better. Hallelujah. And they thought I was crazy. They couldn't understand. How does this man have such peace? How in the world 
can he be so at ease with this? I'll tell you why. Because I believe the message I preach. You may think this affirming gospel is off base. You may think I'm off my rocker, but I'll tell you one thing. This affirming gospel has the fruit that the Word of God says the gospel ought to have. Amen. Isn't it funny if you believe the message that I preach that the fruit of the Spirit will be manifest in your life like it's supposed to be? Isn't it funny if you believe the gospel I preach that you'll have peace like you're supposed to have peace? Come on now. That you'll have joy like you're supposed to have joy. I'm going to tell you, I used to wrestle with depression and, and anxiety as a younger person mainly because of the issue that I was struggling with. But when I finally, 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 finally came to terms and reconciled my faith with my uh, humanity, because your sexual orientation is just a little part of your humanity. Mm -hmm. It's not even a big part. It's just a little part of your humanity. So you're not reconciling your sexual orientation with your faith. No, you're reconciling your humanity, your human nature. You're, you're just who you are as a human being with your faith. When I finally did that, Tommy, man, all of a sudden I found peace with God. All of a sudden my walk with God got better. All of a sudden the Lord was able to bless me mm -hmm. in ways He could never bless me before. Because I'm going to tell you, when you run around afraid all the time, when you run around in terror all the time, you without fail, I know from personal experience, you'll do the dumbest things Fear and anxiety and terror will motivate you to do some of the dumbest things. Oh, you think you got to fix yourself. You'll do some of the dumbest things trying to fix yourself. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. And then in the process of doing these dumb things, you bring more condemnation down on your head because now you feel guilty. Now you feel bad that you did this stupid thing. Oh, I've got, to, I've got to be straight. I can't make heaven if I'm not straight. So next thing you know, you're a child of God. You're in the church. You're trying to live for the Lord. Next thing you know, you're trying to get in bed with some woman just because you're trying to prove something. Oh, my goodness, that mercy. Am I telling the truth? I know I am. I know there are people out there who identify with what I'm saying. We do dumb things in response to fear and we do dumb things in response to terror. When you finally reconcile, when you finally come to terms, when you finally understand and know the love of God and the grace of God, all of a sudden, honey, you aren't doing as many dumb things. You're not doing so many stupid things. Because you're not being motivated by fear and terror. Look at when somebody gets afraid enough in this world. I told you the story years ago. I was working at a Dairy Queen. And a gentleman used to come in. A black man used to come in. And he put glycerin on his hair. He sprayed glycerin on his hair. till it just about dripped. And he smoked. And back then you could smoke in restaurants. Yeah, that's how old I am. And one day he was sitting at the table and he had the cigarette in his fingers and he had it close to his head like this. He, he was doing a crossword puzzle or something. And all of a sudden something hit and, and set his whole head on fire. I don't mean a little tiny patch. I mean his whole head. He looked like a walking uh, torch, torch or, or those things, a flare, like you use it on your car, you know? When you light up the end of a flare, the whole top of it's on fire. Well, that is what this man, they called him China. That's what China looked like, a flare. It all happened so fast, I look around and one of the ladies I work with was behind, just frozen stiff, literally, just stiff. She. You could tell she was in absolute terror, but she couldn't move a muscle of her body. Another woman, well, her reaction was way smarter, much, much smarter. She stood in one spot and screamed at the top of her lungs. Ah! 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 Yeah, that'll save his life. My grandfather always told me, he said, when things are at their worst, that's when you need to keep your head together the most. He said, when things are really crazy, that's when you need to be sane. 
So here I stood, and all of a sudden, I could just almost hear my grandfather whispering in my ear, saying, when things are at their worst, that's when you need to stay, keep it together, and stay safe. And I walked over uh, to this lady that had a coat over her arm, and I took the coat off of her arm. I mean, this all happened so fast. I didn't ask her for a coat. I took the coat off her arm. I threw it around China's head, and I began to pat out the flames. I got the flames out and China sat down at the table. He was in shock and first thing he did light up another cigarette. What's my point? My point is when we're afraid and when we're terrorized by fear, we tend to do all the wrong things and I tell the truth. But when you finally understand the love of God, when you finally understand the grace of God, when you finally come to reconcile these things in your life, you're going to find it's a whole lot easier to live right and act right and do right. Matthew chapter 22 verses 35 through 40. I've already read that to you. Even in the Old Testament era, God's desire was that Israel love Him. He did so many things for the people of Israel, and yet they were unfaithful in their affections, and they were not devoted to Him as they ought to have been. Why? The Lord said to Israel when they came out of Egypt, He told the people of Israel, Repeat these things. Talk about the miracles. Talk about the things I did for you, bringing you out of Israel. Talk about those things constantly with your children. Why? Because God wanted constantly to be talked about. No, no, no. Because He knew that the more that these people were, were reminded of the things He did, the more they would be able to love Him in return. Well, I'll tell you, there's a reason why we have testimonies in church. There's a reason why we give opportunity for members of the church to share their testimonies. Why? So that you can share with others what God has done for you, what the Lord has done for your life, because that helps them to see how God's love is manifested toward you, and that in turn helps them to find a love for God. When we talk about God's love and His mercy and His grace in our life, His blessings in our life, we are helping to encourage our fellow believers to love the Lord back. Mm -hmm. The Lord did not wait for mankind to first come around and love Him, nor did He put off His death until humanity had come to love Him. He went the full length of expressing His love for us even before there were any obvious evidences that humanity would love him in return. Most people will stop trying at some point. I know I did. If I showed a girl, you know, if I was trying to woo her and I sent flowers and I sent cards, and Tommy, don't sit there and act like I haven't done it with you too, because you know I have. <laughs> If I went to all that effort with me and, and, and a gal didn't return my affections, I'd finally get to a point where I'd just quit. Because I wouldn't, you know, I wasn't going to go on forever. I can't take rejection forever. Most people will stop trying at some point. Yep. And they certainly will not go to the ultimate extreme in expressing their love unless and until they've seen some evidence that their love will be returned. That's not God. God's love was expressed toward us to its fullest extent long before He had any guarantees that anybody would not be back. Can I tell the truth? Uh -huh. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely... For a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ 
died for us. The Lord did not strive to make people fear Him. He strove to make people love Him. He did not seek to make people respect Him. He sought to make people love Him. He did not demand people believe in Him. He suggested that people love Him. His mission was a mission of love. Many in the church today have polluted that mission by representing Christ as a figure to fear or a figure demanding respect and obedience and submission who is willing to accept nothing short of complete and total compliance. But in presenting the Lord in this fashion, they do not invite sinners to know the Lord so that they might love Him. And that is the message of the Gospel. In John chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, I'm almost done. If I, if I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Notice that Jesus spoke these words while he was still involved in his earthly ministry. He literally said, the Son of Man which is in heaven. He's talking the present tense. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In the end, the gospel promises us that we shall forever be connected to the love of God. The promise of God's word being that nothing can separate us from the love of God demonstrated to us through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. In closing today, Romans 8, 35 through 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My question this afternoon is, how can you not love Him? Amen. God reaches out. The Word of God said it's the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. God isn't trying to bring you to Him by beating you down and sending judgment and raining fire down on your head so that you'll fall to your knees and repent. No. My friend, Jesus Christ came and died on the cross so that you could see and know the full extent of His love for us. Not his hatred of us, not his judgment of us, not his condemnation of us, not his willingness to condemn us. That, that's not at all what God endeavored to demonstrate to us. He wants you to know that he loves you. He cares about you. If there are people who are misrepresenting the Christian faith and you see no love in them, then please know, please know Whatever they're calling themselves, they are not born-again Christians. 
they are not in fact born again Christians because those of us who have been born again truly, biblically, according to the Word of God, are going to demonstrate and manifest the love of God because we are His representatives in this world and our job is to help you see that He is somebody well worth loving. Amen. How can you not love Him? That's my question. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? I do apologize, folks. I don't know why this phone keeps doing the light dark thing. It doesn't normally do that, so I don't know why it's doing that today. But I do apologize to you for our interruption when the light went out and we were trying to get that fixed. Um, I get, Tommy can tell you, I get very distracted very quickly. And uh, it doesn't take a whole lot for me to totally lose my train of thought. And so I hope to God that I've been able to get this message delivered to you today in a way that you understand and in a way that you've been able to receive. Uh, I can only hope that the Lord helped me to do that. We appreciate your watching. We're grateful for you. Would you bow your heads as we close today? this service. Master, once again, God, we come to you. We are grateful for the word of the Lord. We're grateful, God, for the reminder from the pen of the apostles. We're reminded of your love toward us. Oh, God, you bless us. You help us. You strengthen us. You deliver us. You save us. You heal us. So many blessings come our way because of our relationship with you. And Lord, if only we could know, know, know the love of God and believe the love of God. For in believing and knowing the love of God, we then will be able to demonstrate and pass it on. Help us, Lord Jesus, as your people to be instruments of love in the midst of a evil world, a dark world that's growing darker by the day. Help us to be a witness and a testimony. Let us not love Lord in word only, but let us love also in deed and in truth. Let our love be demonstrated not merely in what we say, but in what we do and in how we do it. King Jesus, help this word, O oh God, to touch the deepest part of our hearts. Compensate, Lord, for any uh, effect that my distraction may have had on delivering this message, let the people of God walk away benefited by this word. For we ask it, O oh God, in none other than Jesus' glorious holy name. Amen. We are so grateful you chose to join us today. I hope you'll come back next Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time as we engage in worship and the Word. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.